I've mending I should do and beds to make. I should not sit and watch the red sun set behind the hills of afternoon, nor take this time to dream when I have work. And yet, supposing that I go at duty's call and make the beds and send the facts, what then? These things have no great meaning. After all, tomorrow they must all be done again. Therefore, I shall forget them, every one, and I shall sit and feel the rising dew and watch the haze around the setting sun. And I shall find time for the others, too, when this, my more important work, is done. I say that because I should have been reviewing my notes just a few minutes ago, and any of you who saw the sunset <laughs> may notice what I was doing instead. So um, we will simply invoke the painter of sunsets and see what happens. Indri's Shah tells a great story about Mullah Nasruddin, the great Sufi mystic. and. One time, Nasruddin was traveling in a foreign country, far, far from home, and ended up staying in one of these guest houses at that time and place where all these strangers simply bedded down in a big room, one next to the other. And one of the other travelers was listening to Nasruddin as he talked out loud to himself as he was getting for bed, ready for bed. And this great mystic was saying to himself, now, tomorrow morning, I'm going to wake up in this room with all these people. I'll be a little disoriented. How am I going to know which one I am? <laughs> I know, says he to himself, I'll tie a balloon around my leg. When I see the balloon, then I'll know which one I am. So he gets out a balloon, ties the balloon around his leg, sighs peacefully, and goes off to sleep. So. Another rascal who was bedding down at the same time overheard him and thought, oh boy, this guy is really nuts. I think I'll play a little trick on him. So in the middle of the night, got up, crept over, untied the balloon from around Mullah Nasruddin's leg, tied it around his own, and went back to sleep. In the morning, sure enough, Mullah Nasruddin woke up in a panic, looked around the room, saw the balloon, and immediately calmed down. <sighs> That's good. Then he raced across the room, shook, shook this fellow awake, and said, please, please, help me. <laughs> I know that you are me, but who, for the love of God, am I? <laughs> now, this seems like a funny story about a slightly eccentric mystic, but the fact of the matter is, probably Mullah Nasruddin is more sensible than most of us are because most of us think we know who we are. We, we have a pretty good sense of which body we're in when we wake up in the morning and what can be expected of that body, and in general have a pretty solid sense of self. You know, we know our quirks, we know our foibles, and therein lies one of the biggest illusions of all. This sense of a well-defined self that takes up a certain amount of space and can be expected to behave in a certain fashion. Now, I'm not talking mysticism here. I am definitely talking very everyday concrete experience. So I'll give you a few examples to illustrate my point. The first one is Let's say that you've just finished the holidays or a nice trip and you come back home, get on the scales and decide that you are five pounds overweight, maybe 10. And you really are not going to fit into your swimsuit, the weather's getting better, so you are going to go on a diet starting tomorrow morning. So the next morning you get up, go downstairs, open the refrigerator, expecting to find that half a grapefruit that you're going to eat for breakfast with a cup of black coffee. And what do you find in the refrigerator? You find one of those, you know, suspicious large square flat boxes that your teenage son has left there from the night before. 
Before you know it, a piece of pizza is in the microwave and in your mouth, right? <laughs> you never would eat pizza for breakfast ordinarily, ever. But since you've decided to go on a diet, that morning you just cannot live without pizza. So my question to you is, I don't know, can any of you relate to this? You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> Who wanted to go on the diet and who wanted to eat pizza? Are you the one who wanted to go on the diet or the one who wanted to eat the pizza? OK, let's take another example. Uh, maybe when you were younger, you fell in love. Let's take the example of a young woman who meets a young man on the bus thinks, aha, here's the man of my dreams. They have a brief conversation on the bus, and she goes crazy. She can't live without him. She, even though that's not the bus she normally takes, she <laughs> takes that bus for a month on end, finally manages to see him again. And he invites her out for dinner, and they have this lovely courtship. And finally, after great longing and just thinking, she's going to die if she can't be with this person for the rest of her life. Yes, they do get married. And six months, a year, six years down the line, this same person <laughs> is thinking, I don't think I can live the rest of my life with this person. I mean, he slurps his soup. So she's complaining to one of her friends, you know, I just, I can't bear it any longer. He constantly slurps his soup. And the friend says, well, didn't you ever, like, eat out before you got married? Yes. Did he, eat his, did he slurp his soup before you got married? Oh, yeah, he slurped his soup before we, So you knew he slurped his soup when you got married. Sure. Well, how did it affect you then? Well, I thought it was kind of cute and charming and, you know, boyish and unaffected. And it, it really charmed me. And now? Well, it's embarrassing in social situations, and he always gets soup on his shirt, and I have to launder 20 shirts a week, and I spend so much time ironing, I think I'm going to go crazy if I have to iron another shirt. <laughs> who is she? The one who thought it was cute when he slurped his soup? Or the one who thinks it's appalling, and she just can't live another day with a person who slurps his soup? Hmm? Is he the same person? Manifestly so. <laughs> It's not that he's changed. She wishes he had changed. <laughs> but something in her <laughs> was identified before with the slurp, slurping as being charming, and now identifies with the slurping as being just something so awful she can't bear it any longer. Hmm? Can any of you relate to this? You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> then there's another one. This is one of my favorites. Um, Let's say that your closet has gotten really full of clothing. And you decide, I have to make some space in this closet. I'm going to go through everything and throw out everything that's old or worn out or that I don't wear very much. So you start with your slacks. And you take out a worn pair of slacks. And you think, boy, these have nearly had it. I better get rid of these. And you say, these are my favorite pants. That's why they're so worn out. I wear them all the time. They're, they're still got maybe another good season in them. I love them so much. Why should I throw away something I wear all the time? That makes sense, right? Throw away something I don't wear so much. So you put that pair of pants back in. You take out another pair of pants you hardly ever wear. You say, OK, I'll get rid of these. I hardly ever wear them. But gosh, these are my best pants. That's why I never wear them. I don't want to get spots on them. You know, they're, they're so beautiful. I paid so much for them. I'm terrified I have to send them to the dry cleaner. I know. I'll keep these for another year and just wear them more often. Then when they're more worn out and I've gotten my money's worth, then I'll throw them out. And you go through the whole closet, piece by piece. When you get done, you turn around expecting to see a big pile of clothes you're going to throw away. And what do you have? Two pairs of Halloween socks, a broken belt, and a chartreuse bridesmaid's dress. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Now, your closet is perfectly clean and organized, everything in its place, so you think, well, I don't really need to throw anything away. It all fits now, now that I straightened it out so nicely, <laughs> right? So who wants to get rid of stuff, and who's holding on? Hmm? <laughs> do, you, 
get the picture? Does any of this sound at least a little bit familiar to your <laughs> daily life? Now that's, to me, um, practical yana yoga. None of this, okay, am I the self, am I the ego, am I the buddhi, the ahamkar? I mean, you know, you can take it apart with a fine tooth comb, but the bottom line is who eats the pizza, who cleans the closet, and how do you deal with the slurping soup? That's where you really have to use your intellect to help you cut through the morass that is the self that we walk around identifying with on a daily basis. Because that, these examples show us that the mind is divided against itself. That the mind is constantly being tossed between competing tendencies in the mind. One part of the mind thinks it can only be happy if it gets something or someone. And another part of the mind thinks it can only be happy if it avoids the pain associated with some condition or someone. Sometimes it's the same person or the same reality that is causing you both pleasure and pain. And in the middle of that, you have no peace. The mind is experiencing constant pain. In the Yoga Sutras, it says, to a person who uses their mind to discriminate, to really look at things and analyze them, everything winds up in pain. Everything winds up in pain. Because what you thought you wanted so badly, when you get it, you're afraid you'll lose it. It wears out and goes away. You have attachment to it. Fear comes in. So the mind gets tossed even by possessing something desirable. Now the problem is that most of the time we don't exercise our discrimination. We tend to take things at their face value and simply to think that whatever is being presented to the mind, whatever the mind is running after, Let's put it that way. Whatever the mind is running after, or whatever the mind is going to get away from, is going to actually make us permanently happy. That's what we're all looking for, is not passing temporary happiness, but some kind of lasting happiness. We want to be in that state of happiness always. So just looking at your own life experience right now as we sit here tonight. Is there anything in your life you ever got that made you permanently happy? Anything whatsoever that made you permanently happy so that you were never unhappy again? And is there any pain that you experienced that absolutely never stopped? That always stayed the same, equally intense, in fact, if we really just look from a very simple point of view, we see that nature teaches us a very deep lesson. And that lesson is don't run after nature. Don't run after things or people for your happiness. And we can hear this. We can know it while we're sitting in the satsang hall. But what do we do when we walk out the door? How do we make our decisions on a moment-to-moment, -moment, day day-to-day basis when we walk out the door in such a way that we begin to create a place inside ourselves where we experience happiness in an uninterrupted fashion? Now, those of you taking the retreat attended Swami Karunananda's Raja Yoga talk, and you say, mm-hmm, I know the answer to this question. I know that the mind, when it's peaceful, reflects the self. And the self, being of the nature of God, is always happy. Hmm. In other words, inside me, at all times, 
is that happiness that I'm seeking? Not even inside me. That's not really the right word because it sounds like outside me isn't that either. As me, my true nature is that peace and happiness so that no outside event can ever, can ever eliminate that from me. Excuse me, I think I need to move the mic. So where were we? We were talking about the fact that your true nature is happiness and that, well, here's a funny story. The other day I was reading a book and it's a lovely book that Dr. Premanjali lent me called It's Easier Than You Think. It's about the spiritual path. And I'm just reading this book, turning the pages, and I turn a page and I get to a page marked Larry King and the Swami. I thought, gee, I wonder if that's anyone I know. <laughs> yes, it was. So it's a, it's a story about this woman turning on TV and coming across Larry King interviewing Swami Satchidananda. And she says that, you know, this is a live talk show, and the kind of audience you get on that kind of show can be very challenging, very, you know, so they were asking the Swami very, very tough questions, and even being a little bit feisty and challenging at times. And the Swami remained totally calm, totally peaceful, totally funny the whole time. And Larry King is watching him intently. Finally, he leans forward and he looks into the Swami's eyes and he says, how did it ever get so quiet in there? <laughs> and the Swami responded, it is always quiet in there if we don't mess it up. Right? It's everybody's quiet in there, but we mess it up. That's the problem. Not just the Swami is always quiet in there. Everybody's always quiet in there. The problem is we mess it up. Who messes it up? Well, one part of the mind is always messing it up for another part of the mind. They, they take turns doing that, right? <laughs> so let's talk about a little practical yana yoga practical, everyday ways to use your intellect, the intellect that can trip you up very badly if you let it run free form, to rein in the tendency of the mind to be tossed by attachment and aversion, to be tossed around by what you really want and what you really don't want. So I'll give you a few tricks. In the Yoga Sutras, it says, what makes us unhappy? What makes us unhappy is mistaking the unreal for the real, the passing and temporary for the permanent, and the non-self for the self. Hmm? So you mistake the unreal for the real, the passing for the permanent, and the non-self for the self. In other words, it's quiet in there and you mess it up. <laughs> you ruffle it up. So let's look at this from a very practical point of view because on the highest level, this is all an illusion that God herself is spinning out for her own amusement. And all of the world is a projection of our inner state, which is why the same person can first be charming and then be totally obnoxious to us, because it's our own projection and attachment that changes, not the, the person out there. Hmm? So if you, if you look in, on all this as an illusion, that's all very well and good, but when you experience a grievous loss, you're probably going to sit down and cry anyway. <laughs> so how can you use the mind to start to discriminate between the real and the unreal in a very, very practical, immediate way? Well, I'll give you a few questions you can ask yourself. You can train the mind to become a questioner, to ask yourself certain questions before you leap and act on your impulses. So the first thing you can ask yourself is, is this real? Is this situation that I'm either running after or running away from real? Let's take the case that you're worried about uh, your mortgage payment. It's only the 10th of the month. 
the mortgage payment isn't due for another 20 days. You have no idea how much money is going to be left at the end of the month, or as Diani Simonini says, how much month is going to be left at the end of the money. Why are you worrying about it today? What exists right now? What's right now? In other words, the mortgage payment is in the future. For all you know, you nor the house may not even be there at the end of the month to worry about the mortgage payment. And that's the truth. There is no guarantee. There is no guarantee. Mm. So if you waste your mental energy worrying, let's just, let's just walk this out a little bit. You, you walk into work that day totally agitated because you're worried about your mortgage payment. By 10 o'clock in the morning, you're already mentally tired. You have a rough day. And at the end of the day, you think, I'm too tired to cook dinner. I think I'll go out to dinner tonight. <laughs> Right? In other words, the worry probably meant that you're going to have problems paying the mortgage payment. If you say, this is here, this is now, I'm not allowed to worry until the 29th of the month. The lack of worry will probably give you a lot more energy, will mean that you don't need to compensate for your negative mental state by spending more money than you ought to, and in the here and now, if you choose to be happy, if you choose to be happy, there will probably be a lot more money at the end of the month than month at the end of the money. Does that make sense? Do you understand that? In other words, you ask yourself that the past is dead and gone. It does not exist. At this moment, it is not real. The future does not exist, it is not real. In the most practical of all possible ways, if you discriminate between what's real and unreal, you will be in the present moment. And in the present moment, you can sow the seeds of a positive future. If you choose worry, unhappiness, thinking that you're not happy because you don't have something, you actually sow the seeds at this moment for an unhappy future. And that will be your reality. That will be your reality. At every moment, you're an archer aiming your error, a arrow at the goal. Where are you shooting? Are you shooting at an unhappy target or are you shooting at a happy target? At this moment, where's the arrow aiming that you're, that you're about to let go or that you're letting go? So living in the here and now is one very, very good way to use the mind's capacity to discriminate between the real and the unreal. Another thing you need to ask yourself is, is this real or is this my interpretation of the events? Hmm? Is this my interpretation of the events? A real classic example is someone lets drop a casual remark <laughs> at the at the um, Xerox machine. And about a half hour later, it strikes you that you think they were insulting you. And your mind starts to spin around on this. That's when it's really a good idea to say, OK, what's real and what's not real? Well, let's just walk through this for a minute. Let us really walk through this. First of all, let's say it is an insult. Let's just take that example, that it is an insult, and they did intend it for you. Is it true? Is it real? Are they accurately reflecting who you are? If so, God bless them. They've helped you to learn something that may help you to change and be happier. right? If it's really something that is negative, a negative tendency in you, they've been a mirror that's shown you a dirty spot on your face. So instead of spinning your wheels, if it's real, if it seems to be an accurate reflection, bless them. And right now, think, what will I do about it? Not hating yourself, not being negative. Right now is the only moment also in which you can effectively change yourself. Now, what if it's not real? Then why would you be upset about it? I used to have a sign hanging over my desk, another quote of Swami Satchidananda, the dog will bark. That's the nature of a dog. 
For those of us with a rather sensitive nature who take remarks very sensitively, it's really a good thing to hang above your, the dog will bark. If you're talking to a dog and it barks at you, what are you going to say? Why don't you speak Sanskrit? It's not its nature. <laughs> it doesn't know how. If it could, it would. So the same with the person who barks at you. If that's their nature, why do you get upset? When a dog barks at your car, do you get out of the car and bark back? <laughs> no. Waste of time. Waste of energy. <laughs> right? So if it's unreal, why do you take that for yourself? Why do you get upset about it? Why do you need that person to think well of you when that's their nature, to see something not nice? Pray for them. Pray that they would have a change of mind and heart so that they see the beauty in people around them. Think how unhappy they must be if they're fault-finding, especially when it's not true. That's really sad, isn't it? To see fault where there is none, that's very, very sad. So you see just real practical yana yoga. Use your discriminative faculty to cut through these ups and downs in the daily life. Now let's say that in the present moment, there is something, there is some genuine reason to be unhappy. Um, you know, your dog died. Um, and you really loved your dog. Your dog was a great companion, a great member of the family, and every time you think about it, you start to cry. Mm, here again, you need to discriminate between what is passing and what is permanent. And the first thing you need to remember is that the pain which you feel now will pass. That you will not feel that pain of loss, no matter how vivid it is right now, for the rest of your life with the same intensity. Gradually, it will grow less intense. And that can be a tremendous solace in a difficult situation. Um, I'll give you one really extreme example of that. Uh, Viktor Frankl, in his incredible book, Man's Search for Meaning, talks about his experiences in a concentration camp. And he would, in order to get his mind out of the incredible pain of the current situation, he would try to imagine himself lecturing on his experience in the concentration camps 10 years after the war. And he said sometimes the pain would be so intense, he would be walking out to forced work, and he would imagine himself lecturing above it, and he would literally rise up out of his physical body and see the whole group walking along. And it would just take him to another dimension. And in fact, he survived several years in the camps at a million to one odds. That's what the odds were that he would have died under those circumstances because he did things like that with his mind. And in fact, he retained his peace of mind so greatly that the guards would walk along with him and tell him their problems as they walked out. That's amazing, isn't it? The power of the mind to choose your response in any circumstance and the power of the mind when you remember that nothing, nothing, nothing in this gross, phenomenal world is going to last. Not this body. That's for sure and for certain. <laughs> for sure and for certain, your pain will end because the body's going to end. The physical pain, the physical suffering will end. So any pain at all, emotional, mental, physical, no matter how eternal it seems at that moment, and any pleasure. I mean, the example of uh, eating pizza or falling in love. You think it's going to make you happy forever, and it's so passing, and then what you're left with is dieting or your spiritual work. <laughs> um, I have a friend who has on her refrigerator, if you meet the right partner and get married, you will make great spiritual progress. If you meet the wrong pro partner and get married, oh boy, will you make spiritual progress. <laughs> um, so discriminating between the permanent and the impermanent is also a very good way to get the mind to let go of its intense attachments and aversion. And the last is the discrimination. Oh, no, I have to tell you one other. This is a really funny story. Um, one of my friends was experiencing <laughs> 
a great loss. Her boyfriend had just left her, and she was terribly upset about it. And she called Swami Satchidananda, crying and weeping and moaning. And he said, <laughs> I can't believe you can't exercise more control over your mind. Your mind has found a convenient ditch to trip into, and every chance it gets, it trips into the ditch. Now, when she told me that, I went, <gasps> you know, because it sounded like such an uncompassionate thing to say to somebody who was in, like, deep distress and pain. So I said, so what happened? She said, well, the funny thing was, after that, immediately, every time I would think about him, I would think, your mind has found a convenient ditch to fall into in every chance. And she said, I would start laughing. And suddenly, I started to see my attachment to him as falling into a ditch. <laughs> and it totally changed the way I felt about the situation. She said, also, he said, you'll get whatever you deserve. And she said, I was really depressed about that for a couple of days, because I thought, oh, I don't deserve him. That's why I don't have him. Then she said, I was reading in my journal. I had written down immediately after the conversation what Swamiji had said. And what he said next, which I had forgotten, was, if he deserves you, then he'll get you. <laughs> if he doesn't deserve you, then you're better off without him. She said, all of a sudden, I realized it wasn't about whether or not I deserved him. This was a two-way street. Maybe he didn't deserve me, and I was better off without him. <laughs> So that's another uh, great trick to play on your mind, right? Whatever you deserve, you're going to get. And when you find yourself obsessing about something, use the mind to name it. Give it a name, like a convenient ditch that you can trip and fall into. Just name it. Then every time it comes up, you say, whoops, fell in the ditch. <laughs> Tripped and fell in that convenient ditch, conveniently located right in front of me, right? You can do that also in meditation. If you find yourself obsessing about something in meditation, you can name it. You can say, oh, anger, anger, anger. Every time it comes up, you name it three times, right? Ditch, ditch, ditch. <laughs> bills, bills, bills. You name it three times. And the mind, once it names it, kind of puts it out there. It's not like all of a sudden what you're identified with. Very good way to Use the intellect, use the intelligence to cut through your attachment, your identification with what's going on at that moment. So the last one is to cut your identification between the non-self and the self. I mean, to cut your identification with the non-self and identify with the self. Now, one of the practical ways to do that, well, I just named one of them. One of them is to start by creating just a little bit of distance between whatever the mind is identifying with and yourself. And the distance can be created by naming it, for example. Naming that emotion, that feeling, that attachment, that aversion. And there are a couple of other really practical ways to create a little distance. One is to develop the attitude of mind of the witness. That is to say, it's not really me that it's happening to. It's happening to my body. It's happening to my mind. My body and my mind are not me. If they were me, then I would just be totally subjectively aware of that experience. But there seems to be somebody in who, who's ex experiencing, you know, slam the door on your finger. Who feels the pain? The finger feels the pain. That's not me. That's my finger, right? You can literally separate yourself, start to ask yourself, who's experiencing this experience? And even the process of asking yourself the question gives you enough distance. Even a millimeter is enough. <laughs> a millimeter is enough distance to cut through the pain of that momentary situation. Hmm? So you train your mind. You train your mind. Uninterrupted discriminative discernment is what the Yoga Sutras call it. You train your mind to have one part that's always standing aside. And that part of the mind is neither running toward things nor running away from things. So in that witnessing consciousness, 
the, the more and the more steadily you develop that consciousness, the more you carry it into your daily life. The more that becomes the part of your mind that you identify with, rather than all of the passing desires and aversion. And eventually, Swamiji says that that part of the mind turns around. Instead of watching all that stuff out there as the witness, it turns around and starts to look inside, behind itself. And when it does that, it says, oh, I and my father are one. In other words, my nature, my unruffled nature, is really quiet in here. When I turn around and stop